Okay, and we're live. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Lovelyn. I'm Maya. I'm Rami. And I'm Anais. And Gerald is still enjoying a fabulous vacation. Instead, Lovelyn Bettison joins us today. Lovelyn is the author of novels, novellas, and a plethora of flash fiction. She, wrote subtle, she writes subtle stories with supernatural elements about relationships and change. Lovelyn's latest book, Perfect Family, was published last February. It is about a woman struggling to keep a secret that could destroy the facade she spent years building. If you go to lovelynbettison.com, you can download a free copy of her first novel, The Box. That's Bettison with two T's, and there is a link in the show notes. Welcome, Lovelyn. Hi. Thanks for having me. <laughs> It's great to have you. I've been seeing you on Twitter for a really long time, and it's nice to finally get to talk to you. Yeah, it's great to talk to you, too. Uh, we usually ask our guests just what you like to read, just to get a sense of your tastes going into the conversation. I read a lot of different things. I read mostly magical realism, and recently I started reading some, like, I don't know what it is, fantasy sci-fi situation. Have any of you read um, Who Fears Death by, I can't think of the name of the author. What's the author's name? It's right here. <laughs> That's how you know Betty, she's loving the book. Betty Okora. I can't even say her name. I've heard of it. <laughs> I've heard of it, but I've never read it. You should read it. It's really good. I'm almost done with it. It's really That's good. That's great. But mm. I also read a lot of Haruki Murakami and Banana Yoshimoto and stuff like that. Great. I read a great. lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which yeah. is important. We love readers. We want yeah. to make more more people readers, as many people reading as possible. And it's really important as writers. You need to read to improve your craft. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and do the summary. So Michael Jackson, Marlon Brando, Elizabeth Taylor all get into a Camry. No, that's not the beginning of a really bad joke. It kind of sounded like it's, <laughs> as I was reading the story, it kind of felt like I was reading a joke. But in in reality, the story is, is about Michael Jackson, Marlon Brando, and Elizabeth Taylor taking a road trip out of New York in order to escape 9-11. The star story starts with Michael convincing Marlon and Elizabeth to escape via car since they can't get an airplane or helicopter. He shows up at their hotels in a Toyota Camry and they drive to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. They bicker like an oddly maladjusted family as Elizabeth is terrified. Marlon is slightly racist and won't stop eating Burger King and KFC. And Michael is overcome with his love for his friends and happy that he finally feels like a competent leader. <laughs> Excellent summary. <laughs> <laughs> so top level, we always like to start just basic top level. How did you like the story? And since you are our guest, we're going to start without Lovelyn. All right. So I must have some kind of problem because I read the whole thing and I got to the end. And I was like, oh, this is Michael Jackson, Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> like, I had no idea until I got to the end. I was like, oh. <laughs> In your defense, I would have probably done the same thing or maybe not have gotten it at all had I not already known that this happened, that this is based on a true story. Because well, my it's friend, based on an urban myth. It didn't actually happen, but it's an urban no, myth. No, my friend told me that it actually happened. Yeah, I know. That's how urban myths start. My friend told me there was an alligator in my toilet. No, but he's, he's like the biggest <laughs> Michael Jackson fan. And I think uh -huh. they're going to make a movie. Yep, they're gonna make a movie but like a buddy comedy, but, like. But it wasn't them renting a Camry. They actually chartered a bus. Okay. <laughs> I mean, there was like plenty of like legit press, like Vanity Fair and like The Guardian. I know really. everyone was reporting on it, and supposedly it what didn't actually happen, <laughs> which is like, right. even more comical. It, <laughs> hmm? it makes it even more comical to me. I really enjoyed the story and I'm going to rescue you a little bit level in because I started I recognized them about a third of the way in but I was like nah nah uh -huh. that can't be he's really in this car and I was in disbelief like I went back and forth for like until the last third of the book I was like could it be no she wouldn't do that would she no she wouldn't do that so that was my experience in reading the story. <laughs> I was like, I scrolled back up to the top and I was like, I'm so dense. There's a picture of a glittery glove in the corner there. Why did I see that? <laughs> so 
I, I listened to the recording of Zadie Smith reading the story. Oh my God. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, so yeah, I figured it out maybe like a third of the way through as well. But in the very beginning, I hadn't figured it out immediately because she doesn't just tell you. So all of a sudden when she, you know, she's doing Elizabeth's lines and it's, you know, a girly voice and she does Marlon's line. It's like a macho voice. And then she gets to Michael. And she's like, hey, it's even girlier voice. It's even girlier. And I'm like, what is Zadie Smith doing right now? What is this? <laughs> Okay, I must say, I read it first, and then I listened to the audio. And Mm -hmm. for our listeners, this is one of those stories that I'm just going to emphatically say, if you do not listen to the audio, you are missing out. Because Zadie Smith Smith (laughs) has, like, it starts out like a normal story. And as the story gets further along, she gets more and more into character. And it is so hysterically funny listening to her do, like, Marlon Brando's voice and, like, Michael Jackson's voice and then in between for all like the regular narration it's like this beautiful English sounding voice <laughs> she does an really American accent, accent. <laughs> yeah. it's like a full performance I don't know why I laughed at the way she delivered Marlon Brando's line where he where um uh so Michael Jackson's like when I have sleepovers with Elizabeth Taylor <laughs> you know, I never fall asleep and then Marlon Brando goes don't stop till you get enough or whatever that like this Michael Jackson song. <laughs> so wrong and there were that's one of the things I really enjoyed about the story is there was there was a lot of humor but it wasn't like over the top like slamming you in the head it was like the subtle humor you're like did she really do that did she mm-hmm. really do that that kind of humor and it was it was pleasantly you know i was smiling as i was reading it and then when i listened to the audio that's when i finally busted up because it was just so ludicrous and there were a lot of like little like twists of the knife you know when when um, michael jackson's talking about how he how he can't sleep unless you literally knock him out and i'm just like no too soon it's any too soon <laughs> So there was a yeah. lot. It was a, it was a very humorous story. Very very humorous. Yeah. Remy, how did you like the story? Did you enjoy it? That was great. Oh. I liked it a lot. Wow, we all liked it. That says something. Yeah. Well, I feel like here's the thing, though. It's it's based on true events, and I think that part of it really has an effect on how I perceive it too. Because yeah, I mean, we like all the dialogue and stuff is added in, but I'm trying to think like if this was purely fictional, if it would have been as good. Because then we wouldn't have because we know the characters, so we can like put faces on them and totally like try to picture them doing this and we like that backstory. Because she never in the story explicitly mentions that they're the celebrities that they are. But I mean, it's kind of like assumed because like if it was just a a normal story with characters who she describes as being some celebrity, would it have had that same impact? And I don't think think it would have because for the first third of the story, I didn't recognize it. And I will say the way she described their narcissism and complete obliviousness of normal life was comical in and of itself. And it really, I could have put in their place any imaginary celebrity. You know, what added to the story were the little quips that that relate to things that we know about these celebrities' lives. But even if they were unknown celebrities to me, I think I still would have enjoyed the story a great deal. Um, There was a lot of little things that she did that, that really spoke to me of the obliviousness of being so famous that you literally are kind of checked out of what's what's important and what's normal. But at the same time, it's not portrayed as them being famous as amazing and awesome either. Like they have problems. There's a reason why they stick together. Um, you know, and that line where where I think he was quoting something Marlon had said, yeah, where he's where he said the only people, only other person who would had been in their shoes who would understand them was Christ, and he died on a cross, and and I think that really spoke to that level of celebrity and the issues they're in, but at the same time they're so narcissistic and so in their own world that it is really funny and. Um, yeah, I, I think I still would have loved it just as much because the writing was so well done. 
I think I'd, I'd agree with Rami though. Like, I think it's still a solid story, even with made up celebrities, but there is something about knowing who they are that has a certain kind of personal level of satisfaction and yeah. your ability to sort of know all the cultural references or most of them and fill in the blanks. Um, you know, like when, when you're, you know, when Michael Jackson's reflecting on how he's never had a normal life from the beginning of his consciousness, if it's just like any stand-in celebrity, you're like, oh, okay, so he's a child star and that sucks. But when you know it's the Jacksons, then you, you have like a picture in your mind that I think enriches the story. I like that you called it personal satisfaction because there was a sense, you know, whenever I would catch one of those things, um, it reminded me of when you when you said a long time about another story. This story made me feel clever, um, and and that's what the story does. It, it makes you feel clever as you're reading it because you're like, oh, I get that. Oh, I get that. You know, and that's really fun experience. I don't normally get that because I don't normally get anything culturally. <laughs> yeah, was that your experience, you, Lovely? Yeah, I was going to say when I went through it the second time and read it it was more enjoyable to me because then I realized who the people were. Like the first time, it was funny the first time too, but then the second time I got the jokes more because I knew who it was. Yeah, that's so interesting. Think, yeah, so I think being able to know who the people are and relating that to what you know and pop culture and stuff makes it a better story. Yeah, and I, I didn't actually know the urban legend. So then when I... We did a little bit of research after having read it. All of a sudden, a lot of the lines change. So, like the, when you first read it and you still don't know the celebrities, one of the first lines is, you know, Michael felt responsible for them because it's his, you know, it's because of him that they're all here. And I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. So, I'm thinking it's some like normal, mysterious narrative plot thing. But now, having done the research, I'm like, oh, because he was performing at Madison Square Garden the night before. Like, it changes everything. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it does. And, <clears throat> excuse me. As you can tell, this is going to be fun for editing because this 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 allergy attack is not fun. Um, one of the things that I also enjoyed was the writing. Um, you know, the writing felt really simple, but it was executed in a non-simple way. And I don't know if that makes sense. But as I was reading it, the writing didn't call attention to itself. It faded into the story. And it really allowed the story to stand on its own. And that's something I appreciate in good writing quite a bit. It's something that, uh, you know, I don't see a lot because I do tend towards more flowery writing in the stuff I read. <laughs> but um, as I was reading this, you know, when I was done, I realized at no point did Zadie Smith ever call attention to herself. It was just very well executed and it put me right in the story. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think because my first experience was listening to it instead of reading it, it's completely different. So normally when I'm reading, I'm, I'm analyzing like syntax and transitions and everything, just like my writer brain or editor brain doing that. But having listened to it first and I went back and sort of like read it, all I could hear was Zadie Smith's voice and it completely changed mm -hmm. the experience for me. Um, so I like I don't have like any deep insights into the prose because I like heard it. It, it kind of wiped over the top. That's interesting because yeah. I do listen to a lot of stories in audio, and I do find that some stories lend themselves better to, to audio than others. And this story lent itself really well to audio. And the stories I find that do that are stories where the prose doesn't call attention to itself. A lot of times, like, um, if I try to listen to, like, Virginia Woolf or something where the prose is part is a significant part of the artistic value where I have to analyze the prose or it sounds unique in some way, um, I can't listen to it in audio. I'll actually get lost. Yeah. Sorry. I'm wow, Rami's thinking. quiet today. Yeah. Yeah. Now I was just looking up the one thing that I was, I was sort of um, putting myself like in the, the cars, like as well as she was performing it and the tensions and Marlon Brando, you know, being like snippy and stuff. And I'm just thinking about the interview that um, Zadie Smith did with the New Yorker about this story after they published yeah. it. And they asked her what her dream celebrity, like if she would like to be in that car, she was like, no, I do not want to be in that car. And she said her, <laughs> her dream 
celebrity road trip is um, Zora Neale Hurston, Louis C.K., Virginia Woolf, and Jon Snow from Game of Thrones. <laughs> I thought I was in love with Zadie Smith before. <laughs> Excuse yeah. me while I have a marriage to go break up. <laughs> yeah. Jon Snow oh, is eye candy, she said. fabulous. That is fabulous. Yeah. I, I'm just picturing that, and that is really, really awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I can't, I don't think I would want to be in that car either. Um, I find all three of the personalities, while they're big personalities and they're fun to watch at a distance, I think up close, I would, they would be very grating and annoying people as written, not necessarily as in real life. But, you know, I, I don't think, I think the the little racial snaps of Marlon would have gotten on my nerves. I think mm -hmm. Elizabeth's total just, you know, she shows up, she, she's gonna escape in a Toyota Camry and she's got all this Louis Vuitton luggage and I'm gonna be like, really girl? <laughs> like, like, I don't think I would enjoy that car ride. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I, I might jump. <laughs> I'd like to be in that situation. That would make, but like we saw here, it just makes for an awesome story. Imagine like telling your friends about that experience. But you've got to get through it to get to that point. <laughs> if I'm jumping out it, of the vehicle, I think it would be so fun and it. funny. I, I, and I feel like I have a lot of these types of personalities already in my life. So I kind of know how to deal with it. Yeah. Well, I've driven cross country twice and yeah. It's funny because I choose my road trip partners very carefully. <laughs> yeah, like, it would just depend on how long the car ride was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm seeing like Rami's eyes light up and everything as he's like thinking about this. And so when I finished reading the story or listening to the story, I thought to myself, this is like celebrity fan fiction. Like, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you take someone else's kind of real stories, except these are like real people's lives, and then you like embellish it. And then you have like the super fans who love the fan fiction, and then it becomes like they're like it's called like head canon, like it becomes true. This is now Rami's head canon of what happened on 9 11 with Michael Jackson, Marlon Brando, and Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> this is the fact, the definitive. It still sounds like a joke. It <laughs> yeah. sounds like you're going to say Marlon Brando, Elizabeth Taylor, and, and, and Michael Jackson walk into an IHOP. Walk into a bar. <laughs> 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 yeah. So did you guys spot I mean we talked about it on a, on a more surface level and I feel like sometimes with comedy um a lot of the more subtle parts of the story gets hidden by the comedy. And as I'm thinking back to the story I'm trying to think of like any symbolism, any themes in the story that I could pick out. And for me I didn't spot any symbolism. Um you, mm, you know, as far as themes, I thought the theme of narcissism, the theme of friendship, the theme of um, being free were very strong for me. You know, the moment when when Michael realizes that he doesn't need to put on a disguise because no one's paying attention to him because everyone's watching 9-11 on TV, I felt like that was very powerful and perhaps as I was, as I was reading it, it didn't feel as powerful because I was giggling to myself. But then afterwards it was a thought that kept reoccurring to me. Yeah. I'm trying to someone else. Hello? Think, but yeah. Well, I was just, okay. I, I, I just, well, rami has been very quiet since Gerald left. And, and we, mm -hmm. we've taken the tack that if we're quiet, eventually Rami has to speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, no, I, what I was going to say is I wasn't reading too deeply into the story to look for symbolism or any of that stuff. I think it was kind of just like a light sort of comical narrative of an experience. And, and that was it. But see, there's no such thing. Yeah, but I, I feel like, but isn't that a funny thing to say? Like, this is the 9-11 story. This is the 9-11 story. We're just here, like, cracking up, like, this is the greatest thing. You exactly. I mean? Like, that. that is in itself remarkable. Um, just to, and, and Michael Jackson's thoughts often, you know, as imagined by Zadie Smith, are kind of dark a little bit. Like, when he's like, 
is this what it's like to be a normal person stuck in a Toyota Camry on the highway? Like he's thinking some dark <laughs> <Yeah>. stuff. <laughs> But it's funny. <laughs> yeah. And, it, you know, it kind of reminds me of Gallo's humor, you know, um, because I think in the hands of a less deft writer, um, it would have been very difficult to have gotten across that levity, given the nature of some of Michael's thoughts, given the nature of why they're in the car, um, the fact that she could portray this really light and airy tone throughout the story um, was interesting to me. How about you, Lavon? Yes, that was interesting. <laughs> no, I liked all the references to uh, the Jumbotron. And at one point, there's something he says about, is this how normal people who look at you on the Jumbotron feel? Yeah. 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 It's, it's kind of like that. It, and, it's and about that. It's that disconnection that they have. Mm -hmm. It's the disconnection between, you know, they live in this celebrity world with all the yes men around them or whatever and they don't know what it's like to be normal and it's kind of uh, um you know at the end when michael jackson realized he doesn't have to wear a disguise it's like he's experiencing that normalness for the first time in his life yeah and i think that is a really important theme in the story. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it's easy to overlook that given how funny the story is. But I mean, being seen on a jumbotron, always being seen, having to wear a disguise. And then at the end of the story, he's able to take it off. That's huge to me. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it can be overlooked as far as giving depth to the story. Because you can have a really funny light story without depth. I feel like the story actually has a lot of depth to it. Um, and I, I just want to point that out. You know, as you're reading this story, you know, to our listeners, definitely enjoy the story. But then go through it again because you're going to see some things that you may have overlooked the first time around. It, it's one of those stories that I can definitely see myself reading again and getting even more out of. Yeah. And the other thing is the way that she kind of frames all of these deep thoughts goes back to that narcissism, which I think is what makes it funny is I think there's something about celebrity narcissism. That's funny. Cause like, if you look at like the narcissism of like a demagogue, not funny, or like somebody who wants to do genocide, not funny, but like a celebrity, like has that comic element, like Elizabeth Taylor's running around with like a giant ring. And then, you know, uh, Marlon Brando criticizes her for it saying, you know, represents death. She's like, no, it represents love. And like, I'm not alive. And they're like debating this right now. So like, there's a little mm -hmm. bit of that. And then there's also like Michael Jackson having thoughts like, I'm really good at the apocalypse. Like he learned something about himself today. Like everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and marveling that he's not on anything because his assistant doesn't know that he's left. Yeah. Um, I mean, not only is there gallows humor as far as 9-11, but there's gallows humor as far as Michael Jackson's death in this story. Um, there's references to his drug use, there's references to him being knocked out in order to get any sleep. Um, mm -hmm. How the how in the heck Zadie got me to giggle at that? I don't know. Um, that takes some skill because those are not funny topics. Those are really serious topics. And I think the humor allows, allows those topics to be brought up in a way that gets at you when you're unguarded. If you're reading a really serious story about 9-11 or a really serious story about death, um, you kind of had a guard up. There's a little bit of a filter because you're kind of emotionally, subconsciously distancing yourself a little bit. But in this story, it kind of just sneaks up on you. And, <laughs> and I love that. I was just going to say, that's the beauty of humor done really well. Like it can talk about those things that you don't feel comfortable talking about you to laugh at it and then afterwards get you thinking about it yeah exactly that's what, that's what the story did really well mm -hmm. yeah and and i lean towards enjoying that kind of humor um uh when i read humor usually i don't enjoy it but a little bit darker humor humor with like a side of realism i enjoy i've gotten in trouble on youtube for saying things where people are like <gasps> You know, I'm like, you don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it's fitting that you say that, Lovelyn, because um, uh, one of the people in her dream celebrity 
road trip is Louis C.K., who mm -hmm. does that kind of humor, really dark stuff, mm -hmm. but you can still laugh about it. Uh, and she's kind of doing a form of that here, but in like a very like sort of like literary style. Like it's not like big and bombastic. It's like her interesting way of sort of doing it, which I think is really effective. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree. Have either of you, have any of you read Zadie Smith fiction before? I've read some of her essays, but I hadn't read any of her fiction before. I read White Teeth and I read On Beauty and I got Autograph Man out of the library and either I didn't like it or I didn't read it because I have no memory of it. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. I know that um, people have been talking about her coming out with a new book. And so I was just wondering because if, if this is how her fiction writing is as far as the skill level, I definitely want to read more by her. I read her uh, essays and they're marvelous. Um, you know, some of them are a little tough to get through because there's just, they're so intellectual and, you know, our school system, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm just like, you are way smarter than me, girlfriend. <laughs> I loved White Teeth and I loved On Beauty. Those were great books, both of them. Yeah. Highly Which one, them. if you were to approach Zadie Smith's fiction for the first time or have someone say to you, I want to read something by Zadie Smith, where should I start? What, what I liked I On Beauty better than White Teeth, but they're both really good. Okay. And would you say this short story is reflective of her style or is this just yes. like a complete departure? Yeah, it is. Yes, it is. Okay. And okay. She, she puts a lot of humor in her books. Yeah. Oh, good. That's yeah. refreshing. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Add that to the book club lineup. <laughs> yes. Actually, we still haven't picked a book for, well, I'm not going to make you reread it unless you want to, for um, when Leveling comes on the book club. She's coming on in a few months. Yeah. That's going to be fun. <laughs> That's going to yeah. be really fun. Yeah. Although I think we might be doing Toni Morrison. <laughs> Teaser. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Just tease that right out there. Yeah. So did anyone else have any um, thoughts about this story before we go ahead and rate it? It seems like it's a shorter story and it was really humorous and, and I can feel us winding down. Yeah, that tends to happen when we read perfectly executed effective stories. We're just like, yeah, we agree. Yeah. That was great. Meanwhile, uh -huh. you know, our, our, the episodes where we had the most disagreement go on forever. Like Delira, how long was that episode? Yeah. We could <laughs> yell we at each other. Over an hour. <laughs> 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 okay, so let's go ahead and raise the puppy. Grammy, hello? It's a six for me. It's a six for you. Look at him going, he's stretching, yeah. he's Man. leaning back, <laughs> he's, he's bad showing off his six. That's a six. <laughs> he's like, hey, lady. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, this is a new fact of yeah, life. This is what happened on 9 11. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Levon? What would you I'm giving it a six, too. I thought it was really good. I really enjoyed it. Uh, am I, did it freeze? No, it's my turn. No. Um, I feel like a ball buster because even though I really, really liked it, I'm probably still just going to give it a five because I feel yeah. like. You know, like it was a lot of fun. I loved it. I'd read it again. It was short, but it is like celebrity fan fiction. And you know, like, it feels a little open up. The angels didn't sing, the manna didn't yeah. fall. Um, I'm giving it a five and a half because I feel like it was perfect at what it was doing, but it wasn't my ideal perfect story. But it definitely was an amazing story. I would recommend it to anybody. I will read it again, and it's prompting me to go forth and read her novel. So, yeah, I give it a very solid, very well-earned five and a half. Actually, can I say five for the story and six for Zadie Smith's voice acting? Oh, my <laughs> gosh. I love her. I love her. Really okay, good. so what are we submitting into the pot for next week? Uh, okay, I am putting in Lamb to the Slaughter by Roald Dahl. I'm putting in The Wig by Han Don. With enormous what? And for me, it's A Very Old Man with Enormous for... Wings by Gabriel A Very Garcia Old Man Marquez. with Enormous Wings. Okay. <laughs> the Gabriel Garcia Marquez, right? The yeah. magical realism? Yeah. Okay. So for today's quiz, I'm going to give you a movie or a TV show. And you have to tell me 
who was in it? Was it Marlon Brando? Was it Michael Jackson? Or was it Elizabeth Taylor? Oh my God, I'm too young for this. <laughs> you ready? You ready? Okay. Yeah. Oh wow. We're gonna start with Lovelyn because she's our guest. Lovelyn, who was in Between Friends? Between Friends? Mm -hmm. I've never even heard of that. Um, Elizabeth Taylor. You got it right. Nice. Rami. Last Tango in Paris. No, it's Marlon so Brando, it's only Michael Jackson, Marlon or Elizabeth Brando Taylor. Or Elizabeth Taylor? Mm -hmm. So, well, it's one of them. Which uh, which act, which one okay. is in this movie? Last Tango in Paris. Well, I know, I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ding 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 ding. Anna Brando. Mm -hmm. You got it right. Annie's God, yeah. the Devil, and Bob. It was a TV series. If it's a TV series, they do cameos sometimes. Yeah. See, I, I've never heard of the show, so I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go with Michael Jackson. He hasn't been said yet. <laughs> Elizabeth yeah. Taylor. <laughs> Lovelyn, yeah. who was in The Island of Dr. Monroe? Moreau. Marlon Brando. Good job. And we've done this one. Okay, Remy. Ms. Castaway and the Island Girls. Yes. I feel like this has to be Elizabeth. That's Taylor, your answer. It's some kind of trick question. Michael Jackson. Sassy answer. <laughs> yeah. There you go. This is an Elizabeth <laughs> Taylor. Everybody's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Annie. I don't know. The Tea House of August Moon. Elizabeth Taylor. Marlon Brando. <laughs> <laughs> I know these are hard, huh? Some of them are a little like you know. I probably wasn't alive for some of them. <sighs> <laughs> I said Michael Jackson. I don't know any movies, movies or that TV Michael Jackson shows. was in. Yeah, Lovelin, yes. Men in Black. Oh, two. I missed that part. I don't. Okay, whatever. One of them was in Men in Black Two. I actually know this one. I was alive. <laughs> Um, Marlon Brando. Nope, it was Michael Jackson. Okay. He was an alien. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was an agent with short hair, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, I do Rami. That. I do remember that. Are you ready? Father of the Bride. As ready as I'll ever be. Father of. See, I feel like. Just based on the titles. All right, so it's either the father <laughs> or the bride. It's not Michael fact Jackson. That that's what makes him get so rid of Michael Jackson. The father or the bride. <laughs> Michael Jackson can't be the father or the bride. <laughs> <laughs> and I beg to differ. <laughs> uh, let's let's go with. <laughs> you got it. Elizabeth oh. Taylor. Right now, I'm looking at a tie between Lovelyn and Rami. I hope I get to use the tiebreaker. Um, Anise. Julius Caesar. Can you repeat it? It cut out while you were. Julius Caesar. Marlon Brando. Woohoo! Yep, he was Mark Antony. You won in my brain. <laughs> no, that's Liz Taylor. <laughs> Okay, Lovelyn. Oh, wow. Okay. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Marlon Brando. Elizabeth Taylor. Darn. <laughs> Rami. The Blue Birth. Bird. Yep. Like you're giving birth to a baby? Blue Bird? Yes. Blue birth. All right. 
<laughs> so it's either the person giving the birth or the doctor. It could be the color blue. It's not Michael Jackson, <laughs> again, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I don't know what that even means. Um, <laughs> blue birth. Um, you got that one right. Elizabeth Taylor. Annie. I liked your logic. Annie. Yes. You like my this logic, is the final guys? Question. <laughs> this is your chance to redeem yourself. Hmm. In a tie, but at least you won't be in last. You can tie with leveling. <laughs> <laughs> The driver's seat. <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah. What? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Rami won, but you know, I I have to give you the bonus question mm -hmm. because it's just too awesome. Okay. Okay. Marlon Brando, yeah. Elizabeth Taylor, Michael Jackson. Which two actors voice characters in the TV series The Simpsons? Okay, I know Michael Jackson did. He voiced himself, didn't he? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, he didn't Michael. voice himself. He voiced somebody oh, else. No. Oh. Because the one where they had and him, was, he wouldn't voice that. He, he voiced somebody yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. The one where he actually was on he the was show, like a fat they had somebody guy else voice him because he was like a pedophile and going, woo hoo! Oh, no, in a <laughs> yeah, he didn't voice hospital. that. <laughs> he was in a psych ward. <laughs> It's it either Marlon Brando board. doing The Godfather or Elizabeth Taylor as herself. <laughs> and then... Yeah. Um... That's tough. No, we're watching you now. I yeah, think Michael Jackson. Your answer. What do you think? <laughs> no, Michael Jackson is right. But then who's the other one? See, I had a tactic. I would just say Marlon Brando for everything. So <laughs> that didn't work, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that that could be a good strategy if he was in the most films. So just like, chan like statistically, he's more likely to be in it. Uh, I don't know because I think based on the dialogue and the story. I don't know if Mar Marlon Brando would be up for doing it. Like, he'd be like, oh, this is stupid or something and just, like, not do it. Whereas, but I So what's know. your final guess? I, but I don't know if that's an accurate portrayal of Marlon Brando, too. I don't know how his real personality is. Let's go with Levelin's tactic of saying Marlon, that's Marlon Brando to, for to everything. And, okay. And no, it was Elizabeth too. Taylor. She did not voice herself. She was Lisa's first okay. words. Fine. Oh. The baby. Oh. The baby. The baby's oh. first words. That was Elizabeth Taylor. First one? <laughs> I thought that was awesome. Wow. That's Maggie. Yeah, Maggie. I get that's a not up. Lisa. <laughs> that's Maggie. I thought that was an awesome piece of trivia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what are we reading next week, Remy? Yeah. Alrighty. It's a uh, very old man with enormous swings. It's by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, okay. and it's translated. But by before Gregory you go, Rapasa. tell us your ideal celebrity road trip in the comment section to this story at literaryroadhouse.com. Let us know if you want us to read more literary celebrity fan fiction in your reviews on iTunes, Stitcher, or Spreaker. Like Marlon Brando famously said in the Toyota Camry, you can die at any moment. So be sure to listen to our other shows, the Literary Roadhouse Book Club and the Bradbury Challenge before any moment comes for you. And lastly, we want to keep this podcast going until the apocalypse comes for us. You can help us achieve this by supporting our Patreon campaign at patreon.com forward slash literary roadhouse. And as always, share this podcast with your fellow famous and important people. Until next time, read a good story. <laughs> oh, my outros, was yo. <laughs> that was great. The story was as good as your outros. Reminding people of mortality. I got more Annie's outro. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Level. It was wonderful. Thanks for having me on. It was great. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to do the book yeah. club with you. It's going to be a blast. Pick something good. really juicy, Annie, for that book club. I want something Well, Lovelyn suggested Home by Toni Morrison, the one she published last year. Yeah. Oh, new Toni Morrison. I haven't read. When was the last time I read Toni Morrison? Mm -hmm. 
uh, mad black girl, maybe like a decade, maybe two. Oh my goodness. Yeah. We need to read some Toni Morrison. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Someone's going to come and like <laughs> scold me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a great choice. That is an excellent choice. I'll go ahead and pick that up before some publisher decides to pull it from the market. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Happened to us with the last show. We had no, picked we a show, and then the publisher at Amazon got into a fight. I don't know. And then they no, that's not what happened. It was um, Sleeping on Jupiter. It was Man Booker Prize um, nominee, and because it got awarded, and because it was nominated, they first saw that people were going to be buying it. So they sold to another publisher and it's going to be re-released in September. But right now you can't get it. Oh, wow. So it was like right after the long list was announced, we were like, oh yeah, that'd be good for book club. Okay, let's put that on the list. And all for a month, I kept seeing it. I was like, oh, I'll wait next month and get it. I'll wait next month and get it. And then all of a sudden it was gone. Oh my goodness. I was not happy. Uh, <laughs> Lovely, don't forget to export your Audacity file as other uncompressed, like in the guest folder. Okay. Room. Other yep. and put it in the guest folder. Hey, and I use what? What, are, huh? what are rags, R A G S? In the uh, drive. Oh, it's Read a Good Story. A I have a clip of us saying Read a Good Story that I splice in at the end of every episode. Yeah. Okie dokie. Yep. Well, I'm out. So, yeah. Okay. Bye, Maya. Bye. Bye, Rami. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Did you figure it out? It's, Someone. oh, yeah. It's oh. file, <laughs> export audio. Okay. Well, and know. then in type from the drop down menu, it's other uncompressed files. Uh, file, export. I have not figured it out. Oh, I suppose. Wait. Okay, other uncompressed files. I see it. What What yep. should I call this file? What do you want me to name it? Level in episode seventy one. And this values thing, do I need to fill this stuff out? Tags and no, this? no, I meta tag the episode okay. at the end. Yep. Yep. So. And then you just drop that into the guest folder. Okay. And then I'll edit the episode together. All right. Great. And then it's the same process for the book club. All right. So hey, thanks. It was great. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> We'll do it again soon. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>